Welcome, all of you. And I want to introduce you to Stephen St. Thomas, who is a certified permaculture designer developing a sustainable homestead in McKinleyville. He is also invites people to come and visit his sustainable homestead with, he's going to show us some of his gardens. I think he's currently sitting in his greenhouse, which he said was 78 degrees right now. I'm totally envious. <laughs> My house isn't anywhere near that warm. Um, so he's also his, in past history, a reporter, and maybe he'll discuss a little bit of that at some point too. But we're happy to have you here and look forward to Stephen's presentation. All yours, Stephen. You're still muted. Stephen, are you there? Uh, excuse me. Uh, we're not seeing uh, Stephen. Okay. Here I am. Uh, we're only seeing him as a small thumbnail on the side. Could he be on the screen? You got the share screen going on. He's sharing his screen. That's why. No, somebody else is. Dusty? I think you... it's Dusty still sharing the screen there. Dusty, gotta gotta you... click that off. Uh, my... yeah. There you, there you yeah. go. Now you can do it. Full page. Okay, so you can hear me. You can see me. Here I am. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I don't see anybody. Uh, any faces live. Well, there's a few. Anyway. Um, real quick, uh, as Jay mentioned, I, I was a newspaper and magazine reporter for most of my career, uh, originally from San Diego. And uh, a couple things happened along the way. One of them was that living in San Diego, um, I got real concerned about what we now call sustainability. Um, I saw San Diego, just the population going up and up and up. The water supply is going down and down and down. So uh, in, in, at the end of the 1999, we moved to Colorado thinking that would be more sustainable. There'd be a smaller population. There'd be more you know, concern about the environment there. And we lived there for 18 years and found that they were making all the same Stupid. <clears throat> decision. <laughs> Same decisions that Southern California had made, which is kind of like, let's have all these people move here and worry about how to take care of them later or let somebody else bother with the water question or the food question. Um, development really is only concerned about building things and selling them. So um, in the at the end of our time in Colorado, I uh, discovered permaculture. And permaculture is a approach to sustainability that focuses on local community self-reliance and building systems that work with nature rather than systems that um, hurt nature or oppose nature in some way, systems that don't use fossil fuels as opposed to systems that do. So uh, that's, kind of where I came. I'm now a retired journalist, sort of. I still do some writing, but I'm uh, I'm kind of a permaculture missionary retired guy. So I'm, my wife and I are developing a third of an acre in McKinleyville into sort of a self-reliant homestead, helping our neighbors do the same, helping to build exchange networks uh, in McKinleyville so that, in a sense, we can kind of meet our own needs more here uh, and rely less on importing goods and services and um, the things that demand lots of fossil fuel transportation. Uh, so that's kind of my background. I'm gonna 
let you ask questions at any point in this presentation that you want. You can raise your hand in, or there's a little, I think, Jane, there's a little raise your hand icon thing. And uh, I might see it, Jane might see it. We'll try to take your questions. If you're bold, just yell them out. If you're not, at the end, we'll have a Q&A uh, for, for questions. So what I'm gonna go over is uh, what I mean by climate gardening, uh, look at uh, the climate change situation in California briefly and then get into some solutions because I think the more you look into the, uh, the peril that climate change is bringing to us, you need to look into solutions too so you don't get depressed. So we're gonna do that real quick. So um, I'm gonna put up a slide here and I'm just gonna kind of go through the slides and chat about this. And again, if you have any, any questions, just jump in. So I'm, I'm defining climate gardening as gardening to adapt to climate change, as well as to mitigate greenhouse gas effects. So there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of decades about stopping climate change. And the reality is that we're not going to stop climate change. Uh, carbon emissions are, in fact, at an all-time high. Despite 30 years of climate summits and uh, talk and whatever, it, it, the situation has not improved at all. So the notion that we're going to stop climate change, I think, is something we need to set aside and talk more about how to adapt to climate change, uh, knowing that it's here, knowing that it's wreaking havoc on lots of areas in the world. And uh, we're gonna need to adapt to that. And the second point of climate gardening is to mitigate greenhouse gas effects. And these are related topics, adapting to climate change and mitigating greenhouse gas. But the idea is you can, you can garden in ways that really help, at least on your own level, to uh, not contribute so much to the, the carbon emission uh, disaster that we're uh, seeing ahead of us. In California, they've done four climate change assessments. You can see the cover of this one. This was done in uh, 2012, 2018, excuse me. Uh, the first California climate change assessment was done in 2006, so there's been four, and a fifth one is now uh, in the works. So California is doing pretty good in terms of studying the effects of climate change and reporting to the public about it, uh, and hopefully that process is going to bring about some kind of good policy, but in my view, we can all be doing something anyway, regardless of what the policies are. Uh, so in this uh, climate change assessment, the fourth uh, assessment that you're looking at here had a, a, a regional aspect to it. It was really kind of nice. They, uh, previous assessments had just kind of looked at this whole state and uh, this one looked at regions. So you can actually look at the North Coast region and see uh, what our region is uh, facing, which is real different than San Diego or Los Angeles or other parts of the state. So that was kind of a nice aspect to it. And you can find this entire report if you just uh, search for a California climate change assessment. But uh, here are some of the key points that came out of this assessment, which is a surprise to no one. Uh, higher temperatures, they figure anywhere from five to nine degrees increase by the end of the decade. Uh, the temperature increase in the interior will be more intense and we're already seeing that. People are out in um, Willow Creek are getting triple digits now. Uh, the, on the rain front, good rainfall on fewer days, meaning that we're expected to have about the same amount of rain. And we've been paying attention to this, and that's part of the reason that we moved here in 2017 was we did our research and we were looking for a place that had a lot of rain. And so this region is 
is good on rain and will continue to be so according to the science we have. But the change will be fewer rain days. So when we first moved here and we were talking about rain, people that already lived here and you guys probably uh, can t attest to this, there was this notion that it kind of rained all the time. And one, I mean, once the rainy season hit every day, now it's not so much. Uh, there are obviously a lot of rainy weeks, but we can expect to see about, we had more than 50, 53 inches of rain, 53, 54 inches of rain in McKinleyville in 2023, which is darn good. That's more rain than we were expecting when we were researching the Humboldt region. That's kind of like Del Norte uh, uh, inches. So the rainfall is still good, but it's coming on fewer days. And so there'll be lots of rain and then there'll be dry periods. And that's what they're expecting to continue, which leads to um, more floods and fires, as you can see in my notes here, uh, because more rain is happening at one time than usual. So that uh, stretches their, uh, you know, pushes against the infrastructure we have for containing water, more floods, and then more fires because we're having all these bouts of drier weather interspersed with fewer rain days. So all of this stuff is kind of the assessment for how climate change is affecting us. The fact that we're going to have more water than other regions in the state, I think is a really good uh, sign for us. It's a hopeful thing for us because we are gonna have this water, that's nice. Uh, so there's a paragraph, I have it in blue here, in the climate change assessment summary that talks about recommendations. And you don't have to read through this, but I wanted to point out the last two here because these first three have to do a lot with ecosystem and management of public lands and forests and stuff. But these last two kind of refer to us who live in, you know, what you might call an urban or suburban or village environment. The second, uh, the, this second to the last recommendation says, Short and long-term planning and investment in transportation, water, and energy infrastructure system resilience. So they're urging people in the coastal zone to plan and invest in transportation, water, and energy infrastructure. The reason I'm pointing that out is because there's one big thing that they didn't put in that list. One of the things that human beings need to survive. Anybody got an idea what's not in that list? Food. So food is not in the list. Yeah, food production isn't in the list, yeah. Right. So to me, food, if you want to call it the fancy term, food infrastructure resilience is not in there. Food has always been the elephant that's not in the room. When you start looking at how governments and politicians and others have thought about planning for sustainability, uh, food is, is the last thing that they think of. In fact, in 2009, when we started a local food working group in Colorado Springs, nobody had food on their list of things we needed to plan for. I think they think that the current paradigm of we get our food from the grocery store and we get the food in the grocery store from big trucks driving down the road, that was just a given. That's just going to continue. I mean, that was kind of, seems to me to be sort of, like I say, the elephant that's not in the room. Um, and then the second, the last uh, bullet point here, investment, energy planning, emergency planning and response systems. My feeling on that is emergency planning typically kind of looks at a three-day period. This all comes from the federal government, FEMA. FEMA uh, insists that local jurisdictions have plans for 72 hours. And emergency planners think of 
shortages and disruption to the supply chain and disruptions to the grid as short-term emergencies that, you know, give us three days and FEMA will show up and save you. And I think this is something we need to rethink and something we can do about, regardless of what FEMA or the state of California or the County of Humboldt does. And that is get ourselves ready for emergencies and of the like that aren't going away anytime soon. This has often been called the long emergency. I think that was a, uh, William Kunstler came up with that term, the, uh, you know, the emergency that lasts for uh, a year. I think of COVID being the closest in my lifetime that we've come to a long emergency. Um, COVID fortunately has passed and uh, millions of people died. That was a, a terrible time. Uh, but it, it it's kind of foreshadows the possibility of a long emergency where our basic survival infrastructure will be disrupted for a long time. So to me, creating sustainable communities is the best emergency planning and response system that we can come up with rather than telling people to think about where they should evacuate to and having a backpack with some snacks in it. I don't think that's real good emergency planning. So what are the permaculture solutions? Let's look at that slide here, see if I can scroll down. I don't know how many of you have heard of permaculture before. Hopefully you all have, but you might not have. Permaculture was developed in the late 70s in Australia by this guy, Bill Mollison, and his student, David Holmgren, uh, in, uh, I think they were in Tasmania at the time. And they were basically asking these kind of questions back in the late 70s. How would we create su sustainable, cu resilient communities and, 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 and dwellings for ourselves and, in, and, and develop systems that cooperate with nature rather than tax nature? This is a great quote from Bill Mollison. I'll read it out loud. The greatest change we need to make is from consumption to production, even if on a small scale, in our own gardens. If only 10% of us do this, there's enough for everyone. Hence the futility of revolutionaries who have no gardens, who depend on the very system they attack, and who produce words and bullets not food and shelter. To me, this is the essence of permaculture, a paradigm shift where we go from being consumers to producers. We go from being on the receiving end of a lifeline and depending on other, a big system to provide to us, to being little guys with our own little system. And I love the, the sense of revolutionary, that, uh, of course, in, in we don't talk about revolutionary uh, revolution much anymore, but in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, there was talk about we need a revolution. And the revolution that we seek is not a violent revolution, but a toppling of the paradigm that says, we got to wait for somebody out there with a big system to take care of us. And the revolution that I'm part of is creating our own communities, taking the leadership back to ourselves and building the kind of community that we want to live in rather than thinking somebody else is gonna do it. So permaculture solutions, I think can be summed up in these two bullets here. Building community self-reliance and localizing food, water, and energy resources. And self-reliance is pretty self-explanatory, but it, it's not the same as self-sufficiency. Self-reliance is kind of a word that means we are relying on ourselves to meet our own needs as much as we can. Self-sufficiency kind of sounds like we've done it. We can do it all ourselves. One person can do this. 
And I don't think that that's realistic. I think humans have lived in villages for eons and millennia, and that's the best organization for human survival, a small uh, community that is self-reliant, uh, meets most of its needs in the community. And localization is a huge part of this new paradigm because globalization, which is what we've all been living through, says, well, if we can't grow kiwis in Humboldt, we can buy them from New Zealand, no problem. We just fly them here. Or we can get avocados from Mexico, or we can get coffee from Indonesia. We just fly it or ship it here. And the, the use of fossil fuels in globalization cannot be underestimated. Globalization has brought about the greenhouse gas effect. We're using so much energy for everything that we are uh, changing the very dynamics of the atmosphere and the climate. And just to give you an example of how this goes on all the time, I just read an article about the power usage required by AI programs. So if you go on your computer and you Google something, you say, well, I'm going to Google permaculture. I want to Google Bill Mollison. You put the term into Google and you hit it and you get some returns about what's on the internet with that, that term. If you ask AI to do some research for you, it will take 10 times the energy of a Google search because AI requires huge banks of computers to run. And I'm just, this is just from something I read in the Washington Post or something, it's not esoteric knowledge. They have what's called AI data centers. So if you imagine an Amazon call center with a bunch of people sitting around on phones, imagine an AI data center, which has a bunch of computers putting together AI solutions, uh, 10 times the energy and areas that are building AI data centers to meet the demand of AI have, have not taken into consideration where they're gonna get the energy for all of this. So that's just another example of how we're just using so much energy that we're creating huge problems for ourselves. Localization will solve a lot of that. What am I doing here? Okay. So let's look a little bit more at some solutions. And climate gardening. So there, are, in a way of looking at this, there are three essentials of biological life. Water, soil, and sun. You got water, you got soil, you got sun. Things will grow, simply stated. In the, uh, in the human world, we call this the elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. I didn't put air in here as an essential because it's really, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a given, at least for now. Clean air does cost. And fortunately, we have good clean air here in Humboldt. So let's look at these other three, water, this is the first one. So in a, from a permaculture point of view, what we wanna do is we wanna create our own water sources. We don't wanna to have to rely on a pipeline coming from the Mad River. Now the Mad River is a great source for us right now. The population of Humboldt County is small enough that we don't have a water shortage here from just our one river, the Mad River. And every drop that comes out of a tap anywhere in the settled areas of Humboldt County uh, North, the Humboldt Bay area, it comes from the Mad River. Mad River is uh, fed by rain and snowfall in Ruth Lake and just flows down the river via gravity to us. So it's really kind of cool. No pumps are really needed until we get to like say Blue Lake and then we've got to start pumping it 
different places and we got to pump it up here to McKinleyville. That's um, that requires energy, something we need to be watching. Uh, we've got a pump station uh, down on the North Bank Road, as well as a water treatment plant to treat the water coming out of the Mad River for EPA standards. But we want to have our own water sources and we want to have that so that we can irrigate our gardens with water anytime we want. We don't have to have the uh, Mad River water up coming out of a pipe. So I'm just showing in these pictures a couple of approaches to what we call rainwater harvesting. Uh, you can see on this, uh, I guess it's on the left side, that's called a swale, which is just a Australian word for ditch. And swales, the purpose of a swale is to let the water come in to stop, slow it, slow down, and let it sink into the topsoil. So the reason I'm showing you this is because this street, this is the street where we live, has a big runoff problem. So it's raining like crazy and the water is just flowing down the street where you can see, that's my wife standing there. She's standing where usually there's like puddles. And what we decided to do is we wanted to take that water off the street and put it into the place where our, we're growing trees. So we have, a, we have a group of trees behind this fence. So you can't see it in this picture. They're on the other side, but their roots are coming down and going towards the stream bed and getting water from the stream bed. And so we're uh, solving a couple problems. One is our poor drainage issue and uh, getting water to our orchard. And we're planting where the water is. So this is another aspect of design, trying to put together a system that makes sense. So we want to have a water source near where we're watering. And we have, you know, on our property, we have a third of an acre. We have rain barrels and other kinds of catchment devices all around the place. And we're trying to catch water near where we actually need it. This, the, this set of barrels, you can see, you've probably all seen this. Maybe many of you have these. These are olive barrels that we repurpose into rain barrels. So they, they're plastic, you know, manufactured products, but they, they came to the United States from Greece, for the most part, full of olives. And so some people are able to get these back on the market. Uh, I got these at the Beneficial Living Center in Arcata. I've gotten them in McKinleyville, a and L has uh, repurposed um, olive barrels and I can get them on Craigslist and stuff. And so what I'm doing here with these, with this, what you might call catchment system, the swale is not, the swale is harvesting rainwater and we have, we use mulch to also catch water and let it sink slowly into the topsoil. We also can catch water in these barrels and I have probably around 20 uh, 55 gallon barrels around the property which fill up real quick and I use that currently to irrigate we don't drink with that water but um, eventually we're going to have a system where we can collect water and put it through a filter and actually we'll be able to drink it we could drink this water. There's an emergency. So there, the, there was a power outage and the pump station in Blue Lake stopped and suddenly our tap went dry and they're deploying a bunch of engineers and mechanics to get out there and fix that pump station, but it's going to be six hours. We, we could filter this rainwater. We have a kind of a industrial size Berkey filter to to, uh, to purify the rainwater we've got. It would need some purification because it's come off the roof. These are all, all water off of rooftops, not necessarily the cleanest thing to drink from, but we have them. Another aspect of water in our system is gray water. So gray water, legally speaking, is water that can be reused 
black water cannot be reused legally under our codes. Black water includes what you flush down your toilet and what you put down your kitchen sink. It seems kind of weird. Why would the sink why would the sink be black water and the shower be gray water? Uh, the reason is that they they want to be cautious that people who are like cutting up chicken in their kitchen don't put salmonella down into the into the drain. And so they they have classified sink water as black water. I don't have any chicken. I don't eat chicken personally, so I don't have to worry about that. And so I use my sink water as gray water as well. You can use shower and bathroom water and sink kitchen sink water, any kind of water. Um, if I make coffee, I take the grounds and I put them in my gray water system. And, and I, I use that water to water my compost. So, Water is precious and essential to biological life. And there's many ways, many small systems that are gonna conserve and I'll make that available. The second essential is soil, carbon or soil, essential building block for our life and Permacultures talk about building soil. And building soil means not tilling up your garden and buying some soil amendments from the nearest store. It's about trying to build soil on your own site. I'm not a, you know, I'm not purist, sometimes I go down and get some happy frog when I need to, but I'm happy to report that I've got, I've got a ton of compost now from using composting systems that I can put down as potting soil and as garden bed soil, and I don't really need to go and buy it anymore. You can see these folks in this on the um, left-hand picture. And what we're doing there, this is sheet mulching. Our entire property has been sheet mulched. And that means we put down layer of cardboard and then we put wood chips on it. So right now you can see they're kind of standing on a mixture of, this woman here is standing, but here's the cardboard over here. And then she's standing on them. They're, they're putting down all these leaves, and wood chips and stuff. And we've, covered our entire property with that. What, what that does is it builds soil on the top of what we already have. When you till, when you rototill or you go through the hoe and you dig up what you've already done and kind of turn it over. I used to do this. I thought it was good gardening practice. But what I learned was you're disrupting the ecosystem of the topsoil every time you do that. And so to, to try to build the fertility and the ecosystem of your topsoil, you don't disrupt it all the time. You just keep adding on to it, adding organic material. That's the main thing that makes soil. Soil is not dirt. Dirt is mineral. Soil is organic. You're taking organic material, you're taking leaves, you're taking yard clippings, even food waste, and you're letting that decompose down into carbon. The process of letting stuff compost and spreading wood chips rather than say burning them in a biomass plant uh, is to sequester carbon in the soil. So when you think about say Humboldt County burn laws. I mean, we're, this region is accustomed to the idea that if you got a bunch of yard waste and you got a bunch of stuff, you burn it and you can go get a permit and do this. Well, that's, I understand why people do that. They want to get rid of this stuff, but burning it releases the carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, chipping it up and 
putting it on, on the topsoil takes that carbon back down into the soil. So that's an example of mitigating greenhouse gas instead of burning wood, uh, scrap wood. And, and I confess, I have a fireplace and I burn wood, but I'm trying to sequester carbon as well by mulching and composting. And in the compost slide, you can see this is like a, a couple of pallets. And maybe you've seen these kind of things. I've done a compost system with barrels. The first compost system we set up when we first moved here was just taking a trash can, plastic trash can from Ace, cutting the aeration holes in it and filling it up with stuff in a trash can. So um, you can compost immediately. You can compost in a five gallon bucket if you want. It's just a matter of letting organic material uh, degrade down into good potting soil. And I have, here we have three or four different systems. We have, a, we have this kind of a, a pallet system. We have a, a barrels that you can turn. We have the trash can. We have compost rows where we're piling up material that we're getting from uh, yard clippings and letting that decompose down to compost. That's to build your own reserves of, of uh, carbon and soil. And just one other side note, the, our entire yard has been sheet mulched by with wood chips that we got from a tree service located here in McKinleyville. So this guy was putting it out on Facebook Anybody in McKinleyville want wood chips? Because if I have a tree cutting job in Trinidad or McKinleyville, it would help me to not have to drive all the way down to Arcata and take it to West Green. This guy's got to pay to deliver his, his scraps to uh, West Green, who then lets it compost and then sells chips and compost back to the public. So he not only saves himself uh, the fees involved in dumping at West Green, he also doesn't have to drive there. So it was a win-win situation. He started giving us wood chips and every time he has a job up here, he just knows where our driveway is and we, we have a compost, we have a wood chip pile in front of our house. And I told all my neighbors, if you want wood chips, don't buy them, just come down here and you can have these because I'm getting them for free. You can get them for free. So I'm trying to build a little community self-reliance in that by letting other people take as much as they want from the wood chips I'm getting for free. And now the last of the three elements, sun, fire. This is a picture of our greenhouse. This is a 400 square foot greenhouse that we built uh, a couple years ago, two, three years ago, when COVID hit, the county planning department put it out that there seemed to be, in, in terms of COVID, more interest in people growing their own food and maybe even growing their own cannabis. And so the county health department, or the county planning department said, if you have a, a greenhouse up to 400 square feet, you could get an exemption from permit. So we built this. The, the structure is wood framed and we got the wood from mostly from resale lumber or it's now called ALVES, which is between Arcata and Eureka. And what they stock is a lot of wood that we can't, you can't really sell it at ACE. Uh, it's, it's got uh, knots in it or it's kind of warped maybe a little bit or it's ugly so you've got kind of your second tier uh, wood that sells for cheap but it's also a, a, a tier of wood that a supply of wood that needs to be used rather than just thrown away so we framed this with wood from a uh, resale lumber we also we built the foundation it's a it's called a pier block foundation so we have uh, a bunch of pier blocks and some concrete 
on the corners to hold up a base plate for the, the whole structure. And that base plate is out of salvaged redwood that we got from your uh, Redwood Acres. Back in the day, Redwood Acres had a salvage yard. You may have seen it or gone to it. It's, they've closed that now, but there was a guy there named, called himself Nature Joe. And he had lots of uh, reclaimed redwood. And this fact, they had torn down a barn somewhere near Jacoby Creek and he had all the wood from that barn. So the, the, the bottom foundation of this greenhouse is from 100 year old redwood still going strong. You can see we got windows. We need to sometimes open them because it gets pretty hot in here right now. I'm sitting in here, it's 82 degrees. I'm not sweating yet, but I'm gonna, in, a, in a minute, I'll show you, I'll, I'll use my little camera here to show you the, the greenhouse behind me. But a greenhouse is, I think, pretty essential to capturing sun. When we lived in Colorado, it was very short growing season in Colorado, maybe three months at the most. In Colorado, climate change uh, was hitting and we had uh, a July hailstorm in 2016 that destroyed our garden. And so we were thinking, okay, maybe we need a greenhouse, but what we ended up doing was leaving Colorado. We don't get a whole lot of hail here we get a little bit, but it's nothing like what you'd have in Colorado. So the greenhouse functions as a way to uh, keep the heat in the, for the plants at a better level, more consistent level. It also functions as a place for us to catch rainwater. And if you can see over on the left side of the greenhouse, you see those little barrels over there. So I'm capturing rainwater in six, bar six barrels along the western side of that greenhouse that I use in the greenhouse. And I also, you can see way over on the left, I've got a single barrel coming off of a shed. And I, we are watering as much as we can with the rainwater. The other uh, thing that's important about sun is having sun exposure on your property. And that's a challenge for a lot of places in in humble, especially places that are in the woods. When you're in the woods, you've got more shade than so. Very hard place to grow food. And even if you're in the city, you might have trees that are shading your yard half the day. So getting rid of unnecessary sun blocking is important. It's part of your design to capture the most amount of sun. Okay, so I'm gonna let you ask questions. I'm done talking. This is our information. We call our place Halfway House up here because we're off of Halfway in McKinleyville. We have a website, adventuresinpermaculture.com. On that website, you'll see a tab for Humboldt Bay Resources. That's a good tab to see information about climate, plants, water, regulations here in Humboldt. There's our email info at the fourthwave.net. You can email me anytime if you're interested in, in, in pursuing any of this information or you have further questions or you want to argue with me, that's fine. Just uh, email there or you can call. We have a 719 number, 719-502-0303. All right. So how long does it take to um, build soil when you're doing it the way you're doing it? How long is it? You build it all the time. You just It's a constant carbon cycle. You're just building it. It's so not I mean like... It doesn't ever end. Well, I know, but you, you put your layers there. You have the cardboard on the bottom to suppress whatever weeds might be under it, I presume. And then you put your leaves and everything on top. How long does that process take to turn into something you can okay. use? Okay, I see what you're saying. So 
there are ways to accelerate the composting process. So composting is is a human activity. It's not really found in nature. I mean, in the, you go into a forest and stuff falls on the ground and eventually decomposes. But the idea of composting is kind of a human thing. How can we get it to do it faster in our lifetime? So we have all kinds of systems. If you're really interested in fast composting, buy a thermometer, look up the Berkeley system. And if you have the time and inclination for detail, you can get stuff to break down in a month. I am lazy. Uh, I just don't have a thermometer and I don't wanna have to go and take notes. And so I just kind of pile stuff up. And so what I've done is I'll put stuff in barrels, I'll put stuff in trash cans, I'll put stuff on in, in rows and the stuff eventually breaks down and I use that in rejuvenating the, the topsoil in our garden beds or whatever. It might take a year. So if you aren't composting right now and you want soil for next spring, just start, start composting it now and you should have some good compost to plant. You, you can use this potting soil or garden bed material come spring. If you want it faster than that, you can look at some methods that require a lot of turning, maybe a tarp over them, maybe watering them. Uh, there's lots of methods. So I'm not a compost expert. I'm just got too much to do to attend to it in a, in a, in a real per perfect way. So I'm fortunately, I've, I just, I'm just harvesting compost from a, a, a tower. I took a, I took a, a roll of, of, of deer wire and just I needed to store this roll of deer wire somewhere and I just put it over and started filling it up with garden garden clippings and a year later I'm harvesting compost out of it out of the bottom the stuff on the top still is breaking down because I don't really turn it in a towel it's hard to turn but uh, it's easy to put in and then I've got my the current version of my tower where I have it on some cinder blocks so I can go down to the bottom and scoop out stuff from the bottom. How many of your neighbors have you effectively converted? <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really much of a, a converter. What I'm trying to do is enable. So yeah. it's like, I have two neighbors on this street who are active gardeners and they want, like they, they wanted mulch. And so I told them come and take from me. And that gave me a chance for them to see what we're doing here and ask about what they're doing there. They're doing a great job of gardening. Um, and I have uh, other neighbors that are not interested at all in gardening, or I have neighbors that hide everything that they do behind big fences. So, I, I kind of go where I can and I meet who I can and I help who I can. So for instance, let's say you wanted a rain barrel system at your house, or you just wanted one rain barrel. You know, I'll help you do that. I'm in fact doing a class um, on the 17th, what is it? Um, let me just look real quick. I've got a rain barrel class coming up. You can find out about it on our website, Adventures in Permaculture. It's going to be on the 27th here in McKinleyville. And I'm going to, so I have two fees for that class, 10 bucks, and I'll tell you how to build a rain barrel and connect it to your house. Or for 80 bucks, I'll, I'll hand you a, a barrel at the end of the class, as well as the information. Because that's about what it costs to retrofit a rain barrel, uh, an olive barrel into a rain barrel. They run a, after you've got all the fittings and the, and the things you've got to have to make it a rain barrel, it costs about 80 bucks. And, and my labor, I don't care to charge for. Uh, that's why you can email me or call me and ask questions. I'm not in this for, uh, it's not a business. You know, it's, it's just my way of giving to the community. I got a, I got a, I got some expenses I got to cover, but 
not much. So what have you been able to grow? What percentage of your food? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't have a spreadsheet, so it's hard to say. But we have a goal. Our goal is to try to grow at least 50% of our food in three years from now. At least 50% of our food in three years. Part of the problem we have is we're trying to learn about what grows here. What grows in San Diego, what grows in Colorado, what grows in Willow Creek, what grows in Eureka. These, we have enough of a microclimate that we have to figure out what grows here. We are literally five minutes from the ocean. We have lots of fog. We have lots of cold. We have friends in McKinleyville whose places are sunny and hot all the time and, and ours is not. So learning about how, what's gonna grow and, and let me just show you a little, let me just, I'm gonna close this down. I'll just show you this greenhouse a little bit because I can easily uh, show you. We, our, our goal is to grow our own food. So we grow what we would wanna eat. So here's, um, let's see if I can get you a shot of this growing bed here. It's hard for me to see if you can see it, but so I have a growing bed here and I built it out of pallets. So it's, it's a, a really big one, a couple hundred square feet. And I built it out of pallets and I put a bench on it. You can see these plants are on the bench. I built a bench on it so you can kind of sit because I'm anticipating that I'm not going to want to be bending over like I do now uh, in the future. So I want to be able to sit down. So like, for instance, right here, I, I could, I could just kind of plop down. Okay. Here I am. I can reach over without having to bend from the waist and I could do some gardening here. And uh, so that's what we have, what we have now planted, Again, this is one greenhouse, but here we have cucumbers and peppers. You see red peppers, kind of pretty. We have green ones too. We have uh, a whole bunch of uh, eggplant that has not yet produced anything. We have the cabbages are being very nice. We just harvested one good cabbage and I've got five or six more to go. This is a grapevine that we haven't permanently planted. We got it at the seed and plant exchange and we want to put it somewhere. These grapes are delicious. Uh, peppers are coming in pretty good. We have arugula. We have chard. So we can do a lot of salad. We have a red cabbage down here. We have dill. We like dill as a spice. I have tomatoes growing in here, but my big tomato crop is in another greenhouse, which is just kind of four tomatoes and tomatillas and they're doing great. I've got some over here, I've got some onions in bins on this side of the greenhouse. And I got a little bit of lettuce in a tub there. We are growing uh, stuff in different microclimates. So we'll, for instance, I, I wanted to see what kind of Tomatoes I could grow outside. The tomatoes don't do well outside at all, but would there be any place in the property where they grow outside? So I, I put some experimental tomatoes out on uh, up against the outside of the greenhouse to see if it creates enough of a microclimate to be warm enough for them. Tomatoes do not do well outside here at all that I could find. So we, we're just always experimenting and trying to see what will grow and what won't. Pest management's a huge issue for us. We have all kinds of bugs and snails and slugs and stuff and we're constantly, they're constantly trying to eat everything first. Kind of frustrating. We're trying different methods. We haven't come across any kind of silver bullet on that one. We've used neem oil and sluggo and diatomaceous earth and 
ground up eggshell. I mean, we've tried all these different things that you hear about and we have not found anything that really does the trick, but we think that the ecosystem needs to be balanced. And so that's one way of looking. Bill Mollison once said, you don't have a snail problem, you have a duck deficiency. So we have to kind of look at it in terms of like, what don't we have that we need to have here that maybe is a predator for some of these things? A duck, than, pond. A, a duck pond. Yeah, we should, we could use a duck, but we don't have one. We don't have any animals here. That's a drawback. Yeah, the duck might eat your food. That's the problem. Yeah, I'm really, ducks, I wouldn't eat the snails. <laughs> anybody else anybody else curious about anything does every does it make sense at all have i missed something I no it makes a lot to... of sense and you do give tours don't you occasionally sure just let me know give me a call you're, you're going to be in the area I'll... <clears throat> Okay. Hey, Scott has said, I com compost every scrap of vegetation. I keep a carton in my sinks and take it out almost every day to a compost bin off my back porch. I only have about six inches to toss in my garbage can each week unless I have company. I add leaves each fall, harvested from sidewalk debris, adding a little from time to time. It's important to add some water from time to time. I'm learning to save rainwater. Hopefully we'll get some. <laughs> If we got four inches across two days in May, I was shocked. <laughs> Wonderful, we didn't have to water for a significant time. I get great mature soil and it grows great cherry tomatoes in buckets on my deck here in Cutton. I can't grow bigger ones though. The only way you can grow bigger ones is in a greenhouse. My neighbor grows great big tomatoes in his greenhouse, but he gets a lot of sun. You know, another, another, to think about capturing sun, you know, a greenhouse is a nice thing, but you can also do hoop house. Uh, a what? A hoop house, much, much okay. simpler. Yeah. You, just, you know, kind of put a piece of plastic on some stakes over a bed. Or we've done a uh, frost cloth. What? A frost cloth. So there's this material you can put down over your beds if it's going to be cold. And this is particularly of interest in places where the, the temperature really drops. It's called frost cloth. And we use frost cloth as a way to insulate when we think it's going to be too cold, even outside. And so there are various, in other words, there's various levels of trying to create a, an envelope for your sun. The greenhouse is not the only way. There are simpler ways. You can dig a hole in your in your, in the ground and put a piece of glass over it and put a plant down in it and now you've got a mini greenhouse. That's interesting. If the plant grows very far, you have a little problem with your roof. <laughs> you may need to put something else over. Yeah. Maybe a, yeah. Yeah. a bucket or I don't know. Something like that. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, or Nisha? Nisha, yeah, I just, I don't have a question. I just want to say it's very inspiring and I can, I'm eager to get back out in the garden. Yeah, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> yeah, I found it very easy. I've got a little section between the front of the house and the garage, it's a little V area and I can grow raspberries there and peas because the, the uh, sun, focuses right in that area and mm -hmm. a great deal. So I have a yeah. lemon tree there and um, I, I have actually native uh, wild strawberries in there also. They are yummy. For the teeny tiny little berries you get, they taste fabulous. They do, right. And they will grow everywhere. They will grow all over your garden if you let them. <laughs> they just keep spreading. <laughs> And we're using, we're using strawberries as ground as a ground cover instead of yeah, grass. Yeah, I've noticed you did that when when I was out there. Nasturtium are great for salads. They're very spicy. Yes, oh, I and love those. But my, the deer eat them. 
Well, well, you can just put a little wire in front of them. I actually can grow blueberries on the on the um, shadowed side of my garage, which is interesting. They grow slowly, but they do grow. Um, mm. And I've been able to grow, you know, plant a plum tree. And one year it produced no plums because it flowered so early and it kept it kept uh, being cold and rainy. So nothing, there was no pollinator. There weren't any pollinators anywhere, but we got plums this year. Some years I get literally a hundred and some. This year I'm probably gonna get about 50 or 60. I have to share them with the raccoon. You get yes, we have, a, we have a bear who comes in and every time one of our members eats meat and sometimes he accidentally puts some in the compost and it and it, the the bear comes in, girl goes in and breaks down the garden fence to get to the compost. Uh -huh. so, yeah, that's another, another problem. Yeah, but you can plant apple trees. You can plant have, trees. Pear trees are tougher. Um, we do have time. apples, and I just planted a new one this year. It's just it's getting some apples, but yeah. it's a brand new baby. Yeah, but the problem is bears love apple trees, too, and so do the deer. I watched a deer hike up on its hind legs and grab a branch and pull it down, <laughs> break it, Yeah. try to tie it back up again. Didn't work well. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to know what kind of roof you have on your greenhouse, and do you have any solar panels at all? No, we don't have any solar panels. The roof... The material for the greenhouse is called polycarbonate. Oh, that's what you it's, have. You know, it's a manufactured plastic product. I don't really like having to use it. Uh, the only way I could build a greenhouse without using polycarbonate would be to use glass windows. And you can do this. I don't know if you guys know Larry Goldberg in Trinidad, but Larry has a has a greenhouse that he he had built. And... It's all, all the walls are windows or glass, which is nice. Yeah. You can't do a roof with glass. It's very difficult to, to get the, a slanting structure to hold up that kind of weight. So I just, you know, I have to make some compromises. I'm, I'm of the opinion that any, the best use of fossil fuels and manufactured materials is to create a system where you don't need fossil fuels and manufactured materials. I had a friend who um, went to all the thrift shops and recycling places and everything, and he took old shower doors and made his greenhouse walls with that. And um, yeah. he used shower sure. doors and this whatever. It was a great greenhouse. He grew great veggies. That's, a, yeah. that's great. Good on him. Yeah. Up in Fieldbrook, had it up there. Had a lot of trees, but he got a lot of sun because he placed it in the right place and got the sun and it worked out great. Took a lot of gathering going from place to place, but he did that anyway. So he picked it up where he found it and eventually he had a greenhouse. Yeah. <laughs> Took a while. <laughs> Osuki, you have your hand up? Yes. Um, we have pear trees and apple trees and bears and deer and raccoon. And one thing we found was a sprinkler, a motion sense sensitive sprinkler. It's connected to your hose system and it goes psh, psh, psh. and right. the deer and bear. And now it looks like either raccoon or skunk who are pulling up our peas uh, haven't haven't been coming, so uh -huh. we're yet to go through another season and see. We've just moved here just a, a couple years ago, so we're getting to know the land and the sun. And um, I, I appreciate what you've done and your concept. And um, we're slowly building with neighbors a sense of who has what and sharing. And, okay. What uh, neighborhood is that? Uh, that is on Myrtle Court. 
we're at the uh, the base of Fickle Hill, uh, right on Park, just off a uh, half a block off of Park Avenue, on the way as you start up Fickle Hill before you even get to Shirley. Okay. Well, that's great. That sense of community is super important. Yeah. So, and, and I would go back to the sprinkler for a moment. What we noticed, because we we have an open uh, passageway down the north side of the house uh, between our fence and uh, uh, between our garage and the next the neighbor's fence, and it trained the the sprinkler trained the deer, and you just see them going right on through down to the next. But since the sprinkler was there, the deer don't come over by the fruit trees anymore. Yeah, okay. and and the bear has not come back for about a year now. I mean, the bear goes through and we see uh, scat, bear, big bear piles on that same runway, uh, animal passageway, uh, but the bear doesn't get into the trees anymore. So suggestion you might look or, uh, you know, I can send you an email with the uh, listing of what the name of that little, uh, it, it just takes two little AAA batteries for the sensor, and then it only sprinkles like just, ch -ch 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 -ch, and that's enough. They don't like that. And where do you get those? At nurseries? Unfortunately, you get them on Amazon. Okay. Okay. We haven't seen them at the nursery, or we would buy them locally. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Very nice. Yeah. If you want to send that to me, do you have, did you get right down my email? Yes, I got it off of the uh, off of the screen. Thank you. Please do that. That'd be great. Uh, Steve, do you have a list of communities that are forming in various areas in our couple cities here? Our McKinleyville, Arcata. You know, i i I don't have a I don't have a very up to date list. What i What I've been doing is, and I haven't been putting a whole lot of time into it because I'm just got a lot to do here, but I started something called the village shift project when we first got here and we had done a permaculture design certification class in 2019. And we kind of, it came out of that. We, we have this notion of, can we break down an urban area into villages? And we had this notion back in Colorado Springs where you have an urban area of close to half a million people. And that, that was way smaller than San Diego, but it's still half a million people spread out over a, a big area. So could we sort of create this sense of villages and get people to think about their neighbors? And so what we've done is we've got a map. And, it, and if I'm at a farmer's market or at the seed and plant exchange, I don't know, Jane, maybe you're on this, you put a sticker on them. I don't know if you did or not, but Earth Day, anywhere I can get out to, I have this map on an easel and people have come up and said, yeah, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of my little village being like what you said. I want to find neighbors and I want to be able to share whatever. So we have them put their a little sticker on the map with a number. Of, so where they live is on there and there's a number. And then we have a list and the number has their name and email address. And so what we can do is we can, we can start to see where those little dots are getting clusters. Oh, there's three people in Bayside or there's, you know, some people in McKinleyville or there's some, some people down at Cutton, whatever it is. And we can email them each other's information. We can say, contact these neighbors if you don't already know them. Obviously, it's nice if you can meet them in your neighborhood and you, if you're walking around your neighborhood at all, you can tell who's doing food production and who isn't. But we have a, in other words, we have a, a growing list, but it's not that great. But if you were to send me by email, or text your address and your name and your email address, I'll take a look at our map and I'll see if you have if we have anybody out there that might you might want to connect. Okay. Um, I think I think 
uh, the vehicle, uh, the app next door mm -hmm. might be a good place to put, post that kind of information also. Yeah, we, we're on uh, next door in McKinleyville. Uh huh. And we have a group called Transition McKinleyville on that, on next door. Uh -huh. We have probably about 70 people who have opted into that group. It's, it's transition is a, you ever heard of transition town? It's a, it's a permaculture movement for collective design, community-based design uh, that came out of England, transition town there. So we have transition Humboldt that Larry uh, Goldberg started years ago. And then when we moved to McKinleyville, we started a group called Transition McKinleyville. We have a next door version of that. We have a Facebook version of that. And we have an email. Yeah. So uh, I just put this in uh, the chat. So it's Hoont, uh, Cobra Jet Spray Animal Repeller. I put it in chat. Great. I saw that. Thank you. Nice. And it's transitionmckinleyville.com? No, no, it's it's a it's a next door group or a Facebook group. Um, if you're in, interested in in social media links, I've got a I do have a little list of that I can send you. So if you if you send me your email, if you email me your email, say I'd like some further resources, I'll send you out websites and Facebook in groups and stuff that I have. Okay. I got Larry to come back on. We used to have a group for about eight years called Transition Humble. And Larry was in charge of it. And we had other people who were affiliated with it. And uh, we did a lot, we had a lot of activities going on, including doing, I led a visit of all the local gardens. Uh, where people were growing their own food. And uh, anyway, it, it used to do a lot, but uh, he went to work full time and the rest of us were getting into our mid seventies. <laughs> it's like, you know what? We need to have younger people doing this. Um, so it did shut down um, and Cooperation Humboldt picked up part of that work, um, planting trees and, and fruiting trees and things like that. And they did also, I think, a garden tour or so. And uh, I had to ask Larry to come back and, and talk about transition, the transition movement. Okay, that sounds good. good. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Steve. Well, nice thank you, you all. And I want to invite you to come back for next Monday's talk on downsizing with uh, Maggie Craft. In the uh, in the catalog, it says emergency preparedness. That's been bumped, that particular talk's been bumped to September 16th. And Maggie, because her co-person forgot to put it on her calendar. <laughs> so we bumped it to September. And so Maggie's going to do it on downsizing next Monday. So she's great. She gives great talks on that. And it's pertinent to everything we're trying to do also. So we all have way too much stuff. Yeah, yeah, too much. Too bad you can't compost some of this stuff. And turn it into <laughs> it would be great. Thanks so much for coming. And thank, thank, you. thank you. Nice to meet everyone. Nice to see you all. As ever. Okay. You take care. Thank you.